All right. Well, first, I just want to say thank you uh, to everybody who came in. Hey, hey, Sergey. <laughs> nice to see you. Nice to have you here. I um, want to thank everyone for uh, being a part of today's cyber recovery in a sensitive world. Um, you know, we're going to talk a little bit today about a couple of things uh, specific to the industry that we're seeing and we hear a lot about. Um, want to have uh, a few key uh, folks talking today. We'll do a little bit of giveaways and things that way. So I want to introduce everyone that's here that you will be speaking with. So myself, I'm Barb Atkinson. I'm a data center account executive for Aptech Technologies. Uh, Todd Frederking is my pre-sales engineer. He'll be doing the first bit of talking. Um, we also have Michelle King from Index Engines and Jason Proctor from Dell as well. Um, inside here, we'll go through what is called the run book. Who is Abtech? Um, the different strategies for data protection, uh, protecting data on-prem, disaster recovery, cyber recovery, as well as what's next. Um, and then uh, give you a little bit about who we are. Some of you on the call, I think, already know who we are. You've worked with us before. But just to give you an idea, who is Abtech? Todd, if you can go ahead. Um, we are Dell exclusive. So we've been with Dell now for roughly uh, 10 years or so in a Dell exclusive manner. We are also a uh, certified Dell experienced install team. So we've been running with implementation engineering now for about five years consecutively with all of the Dell portfolio. We're also a Dell managed services provider nationwide. Uh, we offer services from consulting one-time projects to managed services for management and monitoring and things of that nature. Um, about 35 years of tradition in that services environment, 30-year 30, 30 tradition of service. Thank you, Todd. Um, certified for deployment on all Dell portfolio products that you'll be talking about with us today, as well as others such as server storage and networking. Um, and then next slide, Todd. Okay, here's where the money starts. <laughs> So fun times. Um, we are we are we told you this would be exciting, um, not only technically uh, educational, but also just fun. So Todd is going to bring on the wheel, and we are uh, going to spend a see. Go ahead, Todd. This is uh, I will I will need to know if. All right. David Moody is on the call. <laughs> David Moody, look at you, sir. Uh, you are you are going to be a winner, and I'm going to keep track um, of that. So that's a $250 Visa gift card for you, David. Just in time for Christmas, so we'll be getting these out. Um, these are going to be virtual, so you'll get a virtual Visa from Abtech here later on. I want to talk to you, David, segment. for all of your every information that you never thought you'd need to give us for $250. That's right. That's right. So, all right. Uh, next slide, Todd. Cool. Um, so, thanks, Barb. Um, just wanted to uh, talk with you guys a little bit about um, you're gonna you're gonna hear uh, about some different solutions today, and and really just kind of wanted to uh, put put them in context. As 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 Barb and myself and and Jason and Michelle uh, and in complete transparency, uh, these these three buckets are are gently lifted uh, from from some some talks that I've been a part of that that Michelle has given, um, but really want to just sort of bucketize you know the different types of data protection and and what we're what we're actually protecting against because when we talk about what we're protecting our data against, the solutions that we implement and the strategies that that accompany those solutions uh, play out a little bit differently and. This is not to imply that anybody on this call doesn't already kind of understand some of these things. But uh, again, as we have these conversations, maybe folks haven't necessarily thought about these things in this particular context. So when we look at what we're doing on-prem, um, we're in terms of traditional backup, we're, we're, we're really protecting ourselves against human error. So as an admin, maybe I've deleted a VM, maybe a user comes to me and says they've deleted a file. Hey, yes, I have an on-prem backup. I can go back to whatever date that you need. And, and this is protecting um, my environment and my data against human error. And um, data domain has, uh, has long since been 
the solution of choice um, starting in the enterprise, and particularly since the merge between uh, Dell and EMC, uh, we've seen uh, this technology more and more readily available for, for, for smaller and medium-sized uh, environments that, 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 may have, that data domain may have been previously out of reach for. But in any event, um, traditional backup, uh, typically based on data domain, is, is protecting against human error. But then when we start talking about disaster recovery, um, you know, what, what we're protecting against is something that is significantly different than, than, what, uh, than what we were doing with traditional backup. And accordingly, uh, our, our strategies as well as the solutions that we employ are, are, are a little bit different as well. Uh, Abtech offers disaster recovery as a service that is based solely and 100% on Dell Technologies uh, solutions which uh, Barb will talk about in a little bit more detail here uh, in just a few minutes. But when I start talking about, um, is my data in another place? And do I have uh, the ability to fire up those uh, mission critical resources in the event of a site failure? Um, what I'm doing, how I'm doing it, and why I'm doing it are, are different than what I'm doing with, with, with traditional backup. As are uh, the solutions and the strategies that I'm using to uh, protect myself against bad actors, which is uh, what Michelle and uh, Jason will talk about in, in more detail here in just a few minutes. But um, when I start talking about uh, protecting myself against real life people that are uh, using technology to get into my environment and, and cause problems and ultimately demand a ransom and, and try to get money, um, what I'm doing uh, in terms of vaulting that data, uh, getting it uh, segregated from my production environment, but available to me on premise should I need it, um, are, are much different than uh, the solutions and or uh, the strategies that I use for either disaster recovery um, as a service uh, and or on-prem backup. But fundamental to all of these solutions in one form or another is uh, data domain. And as we'll look at here in just a couple of, a couple of slides, there's a number of different ways to consume uh, data domain. Uh, however, the fundamentals uh, remain the same and um, it is the underlying technology that we see uh, you know, heads, uh, heads above uh, the competition uh, in terms of on-prem backup, um, disaster recovery and or um, cyber recovery. And, a big piece of how we got here is, uh, and, and continue to stay here, is um, our uh, variable link data, data deduplication. Um, data deduplication in general enables me to store more data in a smaller footprint by only allowing, by only storing data that is, is unique. However, not all dedupe is created equal. And one of the core tenets inherent to data domain is variable link deduplication. And, uh, what this example is going to show is, is how this works over the course of a week, but over longer periods of interest, um, the results are, are exponentially even greater than, than what we'll look at here. So the first full backup already exists, already benefits from inline deduplication, which I'll talk about in the next slide. But uh, uh, this deduplication is variable length, which means we're able to get ratios um, that other solutions just can't get close to uh, because our algorithm is patented. And over the course of a week, uh, a, um, a 50 gig daily incremental backup results in seven to 10 times reduction and only requires uh, five gig uh, to be stored. As on the graphic on the left will show, um, during the week, uh, the uh, incremental, incremental backups um, contain data that was already protected in the first full backup. And so then when we finally get to that second Friday backup, um, it contains almost all redundant data. So of the one terabyte da uh, backup data set, only 18 gig of new data needs to be stored. And in total over the course of a week, 2.2 uh, terabytes of data was backed up uh, to data domain, but the system only required 288 gig of capacity to protect that data. These ratios get better over time. And at the end of the day, variable link deduplication delivers uh, the highest dedupe ratios in the industry. And, and, the, and the concept in, in short from a very high level is this. If on a Monday, I write a block of data that's T-O-D-D, -D, and then on Tuesday, uh, I have a block of data that's T-O-A-D-D, -D, fixed length deduplication, which is what universally our competition is using, recognizes that as a unique block of data and is gonna write the whole thing. Variable length deduplication recognizes that I have the T and the O and I have the D and the D, but I only need to send that A uh, as unique data, which is 
which is how we get here. Um, by delivering client-side deduplication, um, DD Boost has uh, historically been instrumental in putting data domain uh, on the map for enterprise solutions. Um, an agent on the client side communicates with the target to verify that the data is unique before it hits the wire. And this has been important for traditional backup, so protecting against human error uh, in, uh, in terms of performance. So when customers have reported that they're having a hard time uh, making their backup window by putting less data on the wire, DD Boost not only reduces network traffic, but also speeds up backup significantly. And then these same benefits play out for replicating, uh, for replicating data over the WAN for DR. But when Jason uh, talks to us a little bit about cyber recovery and we introduce that air gap, um, we're gonna realize benefits as well, but they're gonna play out a little bit differently. So if I'm opening an air gap so that I can replicate data to the vault, I want that air gap to be open for as little time as possible. And in conjunction with variable link deduplication, DD Boost just does just that. So. The point is that just as my strategies and solutions are different for traditional backup versus DR as a service versus cyber recovery, the common technology of data domain plays out in unique ways um, depending on the solution and, and how I deploy it as well. And so speaking of deployment, there are a number of ways uh, to deploy a data domain uh, depending on, on what I'm trying to do. So traditional data domain can be used as a target and supports a number of backup applications. Um, IDPA or integ integrated uh, data protection appliance is everything you need, including a data domain as a target, as well as uh, backup software and a single virtualized solution. Um, we see any and all of these deployment models leveraged in conjunction with VxRail. Um, DDBE can be deployed anywhere for raw, for raw capacity up to 96 terabytes, um, which is before deduplication. And in AWS, we can, we can go even higher. And as Barb will talk about here in just a second, Abtex Disaster Recovery as a, a service solution store trust takes re a replication from an on-prem data domain uh, to DDVE in our private cloud. And then we reserve the resources necessary to spin up those critical assets um, in the event of a site outage. So lots of flexibility in uh, depending on uh, what you need and, and, and how you need it in terms of uh, how to consume and, and, and deploy data domain. Um, so that's a little bit about uh, what's going on on-prem. Um, if you guys have any questions, feel free to throw them in the chat. But Barb, uh, I am going to drag the wheel over so that you can give away some Barbucks. That uh, sounds great. Go ahead and spin it again for me, Todd. And Isaiah from Marin. Um, I don't know, Isaiah, I don't know if you're in the in the I don't chat. see him in here, so we're gonna remove him. Spin again. <laughs> we will spin again. Uh, Stephen, I see you. So I will all be right. in touch with you. I have all your email information, Stephen. So I'll get that over to you. That's another uh, two hundred and fifty dollars for you, sir. So I will get that over. And I got congratulations on that. All right, Todd. All right. Um, well, thank you. This is this is exactly uh, the point in time now where I get to come in and talk a little bit about um, a product we call Store Trust. So I want to go over a little bit about the how we got here. So a few years back, uh, Dell bought a company called Apisure, and Apisure was a tried and true product for backup and and used for offsite for mostly just you know data storage. Um, and Dell. Uh, kind of came out to us and said, okay, who are the grandfathers of Apsure? Who knows the product? Who's working with the product? Um, Abtech was a very large uh, R&D group with Apsure, so our engineers were certified and had worked with it. Long story short, Dell came to us and said, hey, we need you to go in and build a data center uh, for a private cloud so that we can put Apsure clients into a private uh, safe and secure facility in the event of DR uh, as a service uh, spin up. So we did just that. Uh, fast forward a little while later, Dell sold Aperture to Quest and purchased EMC. And then they came back to us and said, hey, by the way, can you now do this with Data Domain and Avamar? Um, so we decided that that was a good idea. So we, being a Dell exclusive uh, extension, we decided that was the way we would go. So how this works, and just kind of give you an idea, 
Um, this is a spin up of mission critical systems for full disaster recovery. So you have a site outage, as Todd said, fire, flood, uh, natural disaster, uh, earthquake, whatever the case may be. Um, you really don't need to be worrying about your data at that point. You need to be worrying about everything else and getting your business back from a physical standpoint. So with DR as a service, it is a hybrid DR as a service uh, product that is powered by Dell Technologies in our cloud and from your on-prem as well. Um, local data domain solution replicates natively to the Store Trust Cloud. How that does that is through either Veeam or Avamar uh, or even, you know, you, we can still do old school rapid recovery if you need to. But it is a tier three secure private cloud. We are HIPAA sar certified, Sarbanes Oxley. Uh, we are a SOC 2. So we do have the Fed ramp compliance as well. There are many different facets that we have to comply with being a cloud provider. Um, it is in Las Vegas. It is firewall secured with SonicWall. And like I said, our hardware is Dell. So basically, long story, spin up your critical VMs. You have a local on-prem. You point it to our cloud using whatever backup software. Uh, it goes to our cloud. You have an outage of some sort. You contact our team, and they will spin you up uh, your mission-critical VMs with mission-critical data. It's going to take a couple of, you know, two to four hours, depending. If you have 100 VMs, it may take a little longer. If you have 20, it's going to take a lot less, obviously. Um, but we do all the data seeding. We do all the documentation. We do all the training. We do all the onboarding services. Um, we have compared this against AWS. We have compared this against Azure. We've compared it against Iron Mountain and a few others for the entire white glove orchestration process and all of the data storage, CPU, memory, the, the whole bundle, we are considerably um, less expensive than some and very competitive to others. Uh, this is a product that we put on Dell. Uh, so it is offered as a Dell service through Abtech. So what that means is to you, the customer, uh, you come to, come to me and say, we'd like to take a look at that. Can we get a quote? We'll provide a quote. You cut a PO to Dell. Uh, Dell then takes care of AbTech on a PO. So it's done as a service with Dell. It's a very, very, uh, very secured and very safe way of doing your DR as a service. Um, we do annual uh, annual testing of our uh, discovery or disaster recovery. Um, it is a five-day test. So it's not just quick, easy, and out. It's a five-day test that is collaborative with you. Um, it is a standard service, can spin up to roughly... We, we try to put it in a standard service. 35 VMs is pretty much the, the ballpark of where we are um, in the Store Trust Cloud today. I think it's the highest for mission critical VMs. I think we have 35 on one account. Um, we can do as many as you want as long as the vCPU and the memory are available. And we can definitely take a look at that on a case by case. Um, other than that, um, the disaster assistance, including network address translation, um, pretty much, you know, the engineers kind of just get in with you and start talking about that collaboratively. This is a case by case scenario. No two quotes are the same as no two DRs are the same. Um, the planning is done by you collaboratively with our engineering and architecture team. Uh, these guys are extremely versed in the process and the way that DR works as they've done it for, you know, 25, 30 years each. Um, other than that, that's our DR as a service. It's called Store Trust. Definitely have more information if you would like. We can get that out to you. I, so, and I will. I'll say one thing about this, um, and I know this is this slide is the Barb Show, but the, the network and the network address address translation piece is, is significant in that when we talk to customers that are talking about doing this as a self service kind of venture. Um, that sounds good on paper, but if you are truly having an outage, the stress level is high. And there is a lot to making the network address translation work so that your right. assets are actually doing what they need to do for both internal and external customers. Um, our engineers are on the back end taking care of not just the, the network address translation, but um, all of that firing it up. Um, chances are you're gonna have other things going on if you've got a site outage. And um, there's a right. lot of stuff going on in the background to make all this happen that we'll take care of for you. And this is image file and block data uh, to the cloud. So, you know, uh, depending on what you have, um, this is this is everything. And after, you know, if 
after if there is a disaster of some sort after recovering from that is uh, from that disaster uh, where data is lost um, our abtech team is fully responsible in taking care of restoring the data back um, from you know to the store trust points but back to you so there's there's a white glove process throughout the entire setup um, and you know god forbid you ever would need it but it's a wonderful service to have should you have a concern about what happens to business continuity in the event of a single site failure. So uh, Todd to the next slide, please. And I, I think we have uh, Jason. Oh, well, nope, we have more money. <laughs> um, that's, that's fantastic. All right, well, go ahead then, Todd. Let's get the wheel up. We, we do have Jason, but we also have 250 bucks. <laughs> Sorry, so Jason. Jason hold, hold, nice please. entry. Oh, I'll, I'll stand aside for uh, somebody to win some oh. money. And Look Sergey, at that, Sergey. Sergey is on the is on the line. First one to say hello to me and look at that, Sergey. All right, so we'll go ahead, Sergey. I've got all your information as well, sir. So that'll be a virtual two hundred and fifty dollars gift card for you as well. And I'll have that over to you today. So next on the agenda, guys, is going to be Jason Proctor. He's the advisory systems engineer for Dell Technologies. He will be discussing. Uh, the cyber recovery side of the house. So, Jason, I'll leave it to you, sir. Have at it. Well, thank you, thank you, thank you. And uh, good morning, good afternoon, depending on where everybody's at. Uh, again, Jason Proctor, Advisory Systems Engineer, Global Technology Office here at Dell. Uh, basically, it's my job to live, eat, sleep, uh, drink, whatever cyber I can get my hands on anymore uh, at this point. So, uh, Ultimately, when it comes to cyber, it, it really comes down to the three eyes of cyber recovery. And, and first and foremost, is, as Todd had mentioned earlier, that air gap or that isolation, that physical and logical separation of the data. And that's what one of the big differentiators of the Dell PowerProtect Cyber Recovery Solution brings to the table is, is that ability to provide physical and logical separation of data. The second part is the immutability. And you'll hear out there in the marketplace, the and, and the reason why I don't use the term air gap all that often is because that's kind of been muddied and to a point that immutability has been equated with air gap. And, and that's not necessarily the case. We here at Dell, we've been doing immutability or retention lock now for about 10 years, and we meet or exceed several different regulatory and, and uh, type of, of uh, uh pieces and parts, whether it's SEC 17A-4, uh, CFTC, Sarbanes-Oxley, things along those lines. But ultimately, what we're doing is we're preserving the original integrity of that data while it remains in that physical and logical separation from the production domain. When it comes to a cyber attack, the first thing you need is data. You need the availability of data to be able to recover from that cyber attack. And that's what the vault brings in with that isolation and immutability. But we've gone a step further, and not to take too much away from Michelle here in a little bit from Index Engines, from our partner Index Engines, but we've also brought in the ability to run full content analytics against that data and provide the intelligence that's necessary to go from a reactive state, just having the data when you get hit, you go and you recover it, you, you walk through the incident response plan, but actually proactively looking at that data on a regular basis, trying to find that problem before it becomes one. And not only having that ability, but also the ability to then, if there is a problem detected, be given the forensics, not only to identify what's bad, but also what is good that should be recovered. So Todd, go ahead, next slide. So cyber is its own separate solution and and dr business continuity is not enough when it comes to when it comes to a cyber event the bad actors they're in the environment 12 time six to seven months on average and they do a lot of different things while they're in there so the statement that i make around that is listen anything that is connected to that production domain is subject to compromise or corruption but we can take the best of the backups and we can take the best of DR as we build that cyber recovery solution for that break glass push button when IT hits the fan, uh, ability to go and have a viable copy of data. So 
you know, backup, it's there hundred percent of the environment. You keep it for, you know, retention cycles and things along those lines, disaster recovery. You're going to apply replication, get a, get a improved recovery point, recovery time, but cyber, we utilize the backups, but we don't need a hundred percent of the environment because in a cyber event, what it's important is to get back to minimum viable operations. Well, what does that mean? Well, first and foremost, it's critical rebuild materials, the foundation of your environment. In other words, the things you can't live without at the end of the day, active directory, DNS, switch and router configs, um, uh, intellectual property, design build tools, things along those lines, V centers, um, the things that you need to have in the event of a worst case scenario. And we always protect for the worst, but hope for the best. The second part of what involves minimum viable operations, we rely on the DR strategy. So if you've gone through and identified the, the important applications and tiered those off based on recovery point, recovery time objectives, and you have identified the dependency for things that it takes to make them work, this becomes a very easy conversation to have. If not, obviously we have you know, between everybody here on the call, we have the ability to help you do that, but we're focused on what does it take for your organization and only your organization can determine this, but what does it take for your organization to get back to minimum viable operations, get back up and on your feet? Because there's additional um, uh, items and things that we can do to protect the backup environment that once we're back up on our feet, we can now leverage that environment to get back to 100%. The other big difference is going to be in the retention cycle. So we're after the recovery of the most recent copy of data. All data has a certain amount of shelf life. And the more that data changes, the shorter that shelf life becomes. So we're not going to go back, you know, a week, six weeks, six months to go try to find a quote unquote clean copy of data. Because if you, if you do that, one, you're going to be throwing darts in the dark if you just try start trying to find that clean copy. But two, you're going to bring back a, maybe some stale data, which doesn't make it viable. So we want the most recent copy. So we have a shorter retention cycle in the vault itself. Physical separation and secured environment. It doesn't mean it needs to be at a secondary location, but it very much could be. So it can be at a secondary or a tertiary site. It can be in a hybrid cloud type environment or even with one of the hyperscalers but logically and physically isolated with the immutability to protect the integrity of the data that's within the vault environment. And then adding in that proactive analytics and reporting that goes along with it. Now, just like DR, you need to have some semblance of a runbook. The difference is DR is very much a step one, step two, step three type environment. It's rinse and repeat. You're going to do the same thing over and over and over again. With cyber, there's a lot of variability, one, and two, it's an all-hands event. So you're going to have a lot more people uh, involved in the overall strategy to recover. So you need to have that cyber incident response plan, and you do need to test. You need to build that muscle memory on a regular basis. Todd, go ahead. So down the right-hand side, you're going to see the first nine steps of kind of what goes through ingesting data into the vault. And it's important to note that, you know, obviously when you're doing backup in DR, you're, you're going from site A maybe to site B, which is your offsite, to site C, which could be an archive or a cloud. But at the end of the day, you're pushing that data. And when you push that data, you create a trail. And anything connected to production domain, which that trail is, is subject to corruption or compromise. They'll either get to the data and try to eliminate the data itself, or they'll take out any functionality you have to be able to access and or recover that data in a timely fashion. At the end of the day, it's the target. We know that. They might not be able to delete the data, but they're going to take away your, your means and your ability. Well, with the Cyber Vault, everything is controlled from within the vault itself. So that cyber recovery management server is actually controlling the process. So we don't leave that same trail. Everything is controlled from within the vault. 
It is its own separate entity. We have least accessible policies with its own set of credentials that are maintained within the vault environment itself, completely separated from the production domain. And then once that data has been brought in, first and foremost, we're going to apply that retention line. So we immediately want to protect the integrity. And then we do our first check. We're going to validate that we have a viable copy of data. It's a copy of data that can actually be recovered. In other words, it's not corrupted beyond the point of recovery because that's low-hanging fruit. So if we can identify that right off the bat, we, we alert to it. And, and, the, and the recovery process, the incident response process begins. But then once we do that, we make sure that we've got a good copy. Then it, CyberSense from Index Engines and Dell takes over. And we start finding out, do we have a clean copy at that point in time? Now, there are certain components in the vault. This is based on data domain technology, both from the source and the target side. Uh, and there's, like we said, many different ways to put this together. But ultimately, those are the first nine steps from a high level. Go ahead, Todd. Next slide. Uh, that's all I got for you, Jason. That's me. Okay, good. That's you. But I did, I, uh, I, I did have one ask. If you can talk a little bit about, and, and you kind of alluded to sort of uh, the flexibility in, in how we would deploy the vault solution. But can you talk a little bit about, about the scalability as well? Um, a, a common question I get is, you know, I'm not an enterprise environment. Can I still do this? Um, can you talk a little bit about the scalability as well as the flexibility? Certainly. And, it, and it's not necessarily can you do it. Of course you can do it. It's, it's, and you should do it. And, and here's why, you know, as I've got on other screens, like I said, I live and breathe this stuff. It starts with those critical rebuild materials. At the end of the day, those are the things that you're going to need in order to reestablish your environment. You can put immutability, and in fact, this is the native tool within the, within the data domain infrastructure, that retention lock. You can, you can add immutability to your offsite backups. You can have multi-factor authentication to be able to get onto those environments. You can establish security officer settings to have kind of a, a set of checks and balances against uh, destructive commands being sent or executed by the data domain. But again, if you don't have the ability to get to or recover the data from a production domain perspective, you need those initial uh, critical rebuild materials and then that, that layer two. But the variability of how this can be deployed, whether it's done on-prem or at a secondary colo site, or we leverage things like cloud adjacent uh, with direct connects into AWS and Azure and GCP and some of the others, or we do this directly into one of the hyperscalers, uh, provides that ability, it's, it's cyber for everybody, where you have that ability to grow into the solution, as well as deploy it based on not only where that data is coming from, but also where you're going to recover that data should you need to. Awesome. Thank you. And it, it, it's just, the the point to drive home is is that similar similar to the history of hyperconverged infrastructure, a lot of you know over the years customers come to us and say, oh well, I'm not big enough for HCI. Well, in fact, not only does HCI scale to no job too too big, but it it can scale to no job too small. And similarly, um, the 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 Dell CR Vault solution deploys as a solution which means it can be uh, as, as unique, uh, both in terms of uh, scope as well as scale for every customer. So um, if there's anybody on this call that thinks they're too small for cyber recovery, um, by all means, um, all data is important. Um, and to you, likely your data is the most important. So um, Jason, thank you so much. Um, that, that, was all, that was all very helpful. Um, Thanks, Todd. Thanks, Barb. Thank you, Jason. Well, you guessed it. It's another time to give away. It's time to give away some more money. So, Todd, do your thing on this wheel here. Let's see who shows up. And by the way, for those of you on the call, if the person selected is not on the call, then Joe Garcia, look at that. All right. Well, Joe, there you go. Another 250 to you. And I will... Get that over to you. I've got your email information and everything, Joe. So like I said earlier, in case you were new, uh, this will be a $250 virtual gift card. Uh, it will be an Amazon uh, gift card to you. So 
we'll get those ordered out and sent over. So, um, guys, next we're going to have uh, Michelle King. She is the business development manager for Index Engines. Um, just a side note, like Jason, she is just an industry expert for what she does, for what she has been involved in uh, from the cyber recovery and data protection environment. So, uh, well-respected, well-revered as, as well. So, Michelle King, the floor is yours, my friend. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you so much. It's great to be here. And good morning, good afternoon, everyone. Okay, so um, everyone, I think, has done such a great job so far of talking through, you know, protecting data from so many different perspectives. And, and then Jason jumping in and really digging into the cyber recovery vault. Um, from my perspective, I want to step back for one second, and I want to think about a ransomware attack and, and what we most commonly see. And we see these attacks, uh, big or small, um, small uh, school districts and municipal, um, you know, uh, agencies and, and all the way through to, you know, large financial institutions and manufacturing companies and, and you name it. And there is no um, client that is too small. There is no client that is too big. This is an unfortunate problem that over the course of the past year or so has grown tremendously and it's going to keep doing that. Um, so think for a second about the anatomy, if you will, of a ransomware attack or a cyber attack, right? There's two components to this. There's the attack itself. And that's the really unfortunate side is that we talk to clients day in and day out that are doing everything that they can to protect their perimeter. A lot of times they start to talk about cyber recovery and they hear software and they say, oh, we've got so many different applications. How can yours stop something that, that, that these don't? So uh, it's a really different approach is kind of what it comes down to, right? Typical malware protection, typical perimeter protection is about stopping the attack. It's about ensuring that this malware does not enter and does not get behind the firewall. And we tell clients all the time, you need to be doing everything that you can to stop this. Um, but you also need to consider that on the news every day, um, attacks are happening, um, the criminals, the malware are getting through. And CyberSense, as part of cyber recovery, is really very different because it's not focused on the attack itself at all. It's focused on the opposite side of that, the other side, right? So the attack being one thing, getting in, getting behind the firewall, but the outcome being being the other side, right? Um, th these pieces of malware, they get in, they encrypt, they corrupt, and they delete data, right? Their goal is to render this data unusable, to ensure that you need to pay them ransom, to ensure that um, one way or another, they're going to get that money. And this really is where cyber sense and cyber recovery in general is focused. It's not about thwarting the attack and the attack not happening. Many times we can't prevent that. It's about ensuring that if this does happen, you're going to get a couple of things. And Todd, you can jump forward one slide. You're going to get three things. And if there's three things you come away from this brief introduction um, with, it's detection. It's understanding that very, very early on in a single backup cycle, you are going to know that something has breached your firewall, that something has gotten into your data and started to corrupt and encrypt that data. It's about diagnosis, right? When and if that happens, what's next? Everyone jumps to recovery and recovery is hugely important, but somewhere in between there's a team of people and maybe even feds that are trying to understand what has happened, how bad an attack is, what the, the scope of all of this is so that you can even get those systems offline. You can stop things from getting worse. You can get yourself to a place where you can even think about recovering. And that recovery, that is the third thing. But this approach with cyber sense and cyber recovery has proven over 99.5% effective in detecting this in a single backup cycle. So I want to try and explain that a little bit more. And Todd, if you move to the next slide, this should have some good workflow um, in terms of what's happening in the cyber recovery vault. If you think back to what Jason said when he talked about cyber recovery, he talked about the fact that everything that's happening is, is being orchestrated inside the vault, right? So there's no outbound push of data. There's no one getting in here. Everything that's going on is going on in here. And when cyber recovery connects up and it pulls that back up in, it disconnects from the network again, it 
applies the retention lock and um, you know, make sure that, that all those pieces are done. As soon as it's got those backups every single day, the next thing it does is it sends a message to CyberSense and it says, hey, we've got a new backup, get to work. And CyberSense does exactly that. Um, now that process we could talk about for hours and, and I trust me can talk for hours about this, <laughs> um, but <laughs> simply speaking, um, think about the name index engines. Where did this come from? Index engines has been indexing data at the bit level for almost 20 years now, right? We've been around since the early 2000s. We built a technology that, that is a forensically sound bit level process that can index data inside a backup. So the first thing that CyberSense does when it knows it has a good backup is it creates a complete index of that data, not metadata, not just, hey, what's this data doing? But what does this data look like inside? Can I read the words in the Word document, the cells in the spreadsheet, right? What does it look like? It then takes 180 plus different statistics and it runs them across that backup. What the data entropy looks like, right? Entropy is the random disorder of a file. How uh, random are, are, is this data, right? Does it look like it could be maliciously encrypted? Do the extensions and then the actual header and file type match? Uh, how many files are corrupt? Um, how many files are encrypted, right? There are tons and tons of statistics that we could dive into um, for hours here. But these statistics are what we put into a machine learning model. And everybody jumps in and talks about AI and ML and how great it all is. And it really, really is. But what does that mean? Well, what it means here is that we've taken uh, somewhere between two and 3,000 pieces of malware and we've set them free on data. We've let them corrupt and encrypt and, and you know, muck up data to, to the extent that it's not even readable. And we've fed that into our application and said, this is what data looks like when it's been affected by a ransomware attack, when it's encrypted, when it's corrupted, when it's deleted in mass. Um, this is bad. This is what bad looks like. So those analytics get run through that model and that data comparison gets done every single day to say this data looks intact, it has integrity, or the, the integrity of this data is changing. We're not comfortable with it. We need to, 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 to call an alert to it, right? And this happens every single day in the cyber recovery vault. And in addition to that, all data gets compared to the last time it's been seen. So if you think about what's happening in the vault and these backups are coming in day in and day out, I'm smarter today than I was yesterday. And tomorrow I'm going to be smarter than I was today because I'm building upon an understanding of what this data looks like and how it's changing over time. And, and this workflow has detected uh, breaches in a single cycle. Day one, when a vault was installed, we told the customer, you have a problem. They did not believe it was possible. We found five-year-old data that was not cleaned up that was sitting and got put into that vault. It wasn't even a new attack, and we still found it on day one. It's found integrity issues with data. Um, there's all kinds of things that have gone on on a day-in and day-out cycle. But this is what's happening, and this is why it's so different. CyberSense doesn't look for the digital signature of malware. It doesn't even look for the malware up front. It looks for signs that the data is losing integrity. Think about what's going on in that vault. You're putting your most prized assets into that vault saying, this is what I'm going to need to recover. CyberSense is validating that every single day. You don't want to wait till you need that data. You want to validate it today when you put it into the vault. So on the back side of this slide, uh, talks a little bit about the, the other side of it, right? What if corruption is detected? Then what are we going to do? And really, simply speaking, and, and Todd, you can move forward one slide. It's a little redundant. It takes us to, you know, okay, we detected something. We've thrown an alert. We've let you know that there's a problem. What happens now? 
CyberSense puts a flag in its database on every single file that it believes is corrupted or encrypted. You now have the ability within an instant to get into that vault and understand exactly what data appears to be corrupted or encrypted or altered, where that data sits, when that process happened. All this logging is going to enable the, the, the user to understand way more than, than, than a ransom notice or a blue screen. You can get those affected systems offline very, very quickly with a clear understanding of what's going on. You can research, you can see mod times on all that data and track it down. And more importantly, once that's all done and you've triaged that data, you can move into recovery mode. CyberSense also knows, not it doesn't just know, hey, here's a bad copy of the data. It knows Here's the last time I saw a good copy of the data. This report on screen is CyberSense presenting back to cyber recovery. These are the nine backups that need to be restored to bring this system back online after a malware attack. We're going to minimize downtime both from a diagnosis perspective, but also from a recovery perspective to understand what data is bad and to understand where the clean copy of the data is, is a huge, huge step in the right direction if you're, if you're put into this situation. So again, I can talk for hours about this stuff, but um, kind of quick overview, you're, you're looking at, at Obviously, um, getting that notification, knowing the data is good every day, knowing if it's not, that you've got the ability to diagnose and you've got the ability ultimately to recover right through the cyber recovery vault and your good data. So, Todd, I'm going to step back and, and turn that back. I don't know if anybody has any questions or wants to learn more, but um, I'll turn it over to you guys. You guys can definitely throw those in the Q&A. And thanks, Michelle. And um, there's a lot of very, there's a lot of goodness in the entire solution, but this is definitely a significant piece of the special sauce. And when folks want to talk about competitive uh, solutions and or um, even some other very high level breaches that have been in the news uh, in the last even 12 months, um, the cyber sense um, piece is is significant and it's significantly different in terms of how it's looking at data and what it's looking for. Um, to Michelle's point, um, these guys that are writing and, and gals that are writing malware, they're better than, than solutions that are just looking for malware agents. There's, there's a lot more going on and, and, and nobody else in the marketplace is looking at data at this granular level with as many as, with many, as many metrics um, as CyberSense is. So,
Um, 